begin with 256. It is well with my soul. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my God thou hast taught me to say, it is well. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. With my soul. It is well. It is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blast assurance control that Christ hath regarded my helpless estate. And has shed his own blood for my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. I sit, O oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. And Lord, haste the day when my fate shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. And all those that are blood bought by the death of Christ can say it is well. Let's take our Bibles for our time of the scripture before the message and turn to the little book of Jude, Epistle of Jude. Sometimes we think that we live in the worst era of apostasy, and yet here Jude writing to those in the first century warns already of that apostasy. That even then it was raising its ugly head. In fact, you go all the way back to the fall of Adam. So when did the apostasy begin? Well, it was in the fall. And the consequences then come down on 
all of Adam's race. But here, this is written by Jude. It says in verse 1, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, the author of the other epistle to James. And James was the brother of Jesus that Mary and Joseph would have had after Christ had been born. She was a virgin when uh, she brought forth our Lord Jesus Christ, but afterward had other children, James being one of them. And so saying here, the brother of James, that means Jude also would have been one of the Lord's half-brothers. What I find joyous here is that when you read in the Gospel of John, initially it said none of his brothers believed on him. And that was in the beginning of Christ's ministry. So we don't know whether every one of those brethren the Lord did draw to himself, but we know James and Jude would have been the Lord's. And so he writes to them that are sanctified by God the Father, set apart by God the Father unto Christ, and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. So right here in verse 1 you see the threefold work of God, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. The Spirit being the one who does the calling. So any that are sanctified by God the Father, it is in Christ. That's in their election. And preserved in Jesus Christ. Once given to Christ, Christ came and paid the sin debt, and therein is their salvation. And then called everyone that the Father chose, and for whom Christ paid the debt, the Spirit of God has called, or does call. So he says, mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. What a special salutation this is for those who are the Lord's. So he says, beloved, they're beloved of God, because God the Father chose them in his love, but beloved of the brethren. We share the same hope together, beloved. When I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, even back here in the first century, as the Lord began to draw in Gentiles along with the Jews, and it became a, a mixed congregation. And so Jude had on his mind and heart to write of that common salvation, which all who are the Lord's enjoy in him. It's not common in the sense of just every day, but common in the sense of communion. This is the one salvation it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints so already there was creeping into the congregation ones who were not of the faith and were coming in with diverse doctrines that were not as it's described here that faith was delivered unto the saints of all those the word saints there means the sanctified and justified ones in Christ. There's that faith that here is talking about the objective faith of the gospel. It goes all the way back to Adam. It goes back to the garden. That one faith delivered unto the saints. It was illustrated there in the garden with God slaying those innocent animals and clothing Adam and Eve. That's that one faith. There were these that were coming in, as it described in verse 4, certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. People contest today about God's sovereignty, and they say, well, he ordains to salvation, but he never ordained anybody to condemnation. Well, go back and read it. It says, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation ungodly men the word ungodly there is what we are by nature we're all by nature ungodly men the only difference is that when Christ died he died for the ungodly those for whom he paid the debt now are considered to be righteous but otherwise left to themselves ungodly men 
It says, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Perverting the gospel. Paul warned the Galatians about this. That these that came in were perverting the gospel and in essence preaching another gospel. All it takes to pervert the gospel or to turn the grace of our God into lasciviousness is to add man's work to it. Many of these creeping in unawares, that's what they were going about preaching, just like what Paul faced in his preaching. These were Judaizers. These were people that were saying, yeah, but we still have to keep certain parts of the law. Does that sound familiar? You know, there's some that they say, you know, we believe in the death of Christ, but you now they go back and want to add the works of the law to it. And that is to deny the only Lord God and or even our Lord Jesus Christ. To deny that that work was finished and accomplished in Calvary. To say that it's Christ plus anything is a perversion of the gospel. And it's to deny, deny the Lord. That's what Paul said in Galatians 2.21. He said, I don't frustrate the grace of God. I don't confuse it. That if in any way salvation comes by obedience to the law, he said Christ is dead in vain. You make the death of Christ to be in none effect. And that's how many are preaching him today. They're saying that Christ died, but it's a down payment. Now you have to do something. He said, I will therefore put you in remembrance. Though ye once knew this, how the Lord that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. Well, that was the majority of the people that came out of Egypt. It's like today, the majority of people that profess to be Christian, and yet they believe not. In other words, they speak of the work of the Lord. They might even talk about redemption and salvation and say they believe that Christ died for them. And yet they don't believe what the scriptures teach about salvation. They hold the Bible as the word of God, but they don't believe the God of the Bible. And so he gives some illustration of the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. He hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness under the judgment of the great day, given examples of even the angels that were created beings of God and yet fell. And a bunch of people today that never believe God will ever judge them. They falsely think that because they have done something or professed according to how they've been taught that they're all right. Well, it gives examples of God's judgment here, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Those words, fornication and going after strange flesh, are used in the Scripture to describe apostasy. Perverting the message of Christ and going after other doctrines that are taught. I mentioned before that the word doctrines in Scripture has to do with false doctrines. There, there are many. But the doctrine of Christ is singular. That's that one faith which was once delivered unto the saints. And the sum of it is simply this, that the work of salvation was worked out on behalf of God's people by the Lord Jesus Christ. Period. So he calls them here in verse 8, Likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. We have those running around today believing they really got an upper hand on Satan. And so they gather and they call down. They even use the name of, of the Lord to denounce Satan as if they have some power in them. You've heard people do that. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I bind you, Satan. You hear him talking that way. I actually saw a preacher one time that brought a bunch of balloons up with him 
on the platform, and while he was yelling out that very same thing, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are going to chase Satan out of this city. And every time he said that, he stomped a balloon. It's unbelievable when you think about it. It's going to pop everybody to God. Amen. They're filthy dreamers. And they defile the flesh in that they make people think that somehow they're better for doing that when they aren't. They despise the beings that speak evil from dignitaries. He gives here example, verse 9, Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuked him. I've done some study on Michael, and it says here, Michael itself means who is like God. So there's something about his name that is distinguishes him from just being an angel. But it says here, because this is where people get confused, the archangel actually means the prince of angels. Who is the prince of angels but the Lord Jesus himself? And I believe that where you see Michael's name mentioned, it's always in the context of a battle and contending on behalf of his church, his people. You can read over in Revelation chapter 12 where it talks about him contending by the blood. When he shed his blood, that's when Satan was defeated. And so here, I believe the sense is, because some say, well, it says that he durst not bring against the devil a railing accusation concerning Moses' body that said the Lord rebuked him. Well, there's times where our Lord even spoke in the third person when he said the Son of Man is come. Well, he is the Son of Man. And so it's not as if he's not the Lord here, but he didn't contend with Satan at this particular point. Why? Because that was reserved for when he would come in the flesh. And he would work out the salvation, and that would be the death blow to say he didn't have to contend with it. He's the Lord. It's like when you read over in Zechariah chapter 3, it says there, the Lord said to Satan, and then it says, the Lord rebuked you, Satan. So you have the same thing. I would encourage you to look at it and study it, but as I've seen the name Michael, I know we've all been raised to think that that's one of the angels. But I believe, even as it's described here, it's, it's none other than Christ himself, the in a pre-incarnate state, contending with the devil, knowing that the devil's day would come, but as a man, he would come in the flesh and work out this salvation, of whom Moses would have been one of the Lord's elect for whom he came. Remember, he was one of the ones there on the Mount of Transfiguration that appeared there when they speak of, of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why he didn't have to say anything here. The Lord rebuked him. Your day is coming. But these, going back now to these certain people that men have crept in unawares, these speak evil of those things which they know not. They act as if they have some power over Satan. But what they know naturally as brute beasts and those things, they corrupt themselves. I'll tell you, this describes the majority of our religious generation today. They boast of things they know not. And in that, they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them. You notice three here taken from the Old Testament that describe apostate. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of kings. Cain and Abel. The separation God made between Cain, who was of the seed of the serpent, and Abel, the seed of the woman, and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward. Each of these are described as doing what they do for personal gain. That's what you find here. And perished in the gain saying of Korah, the sons of Korah, who argued that Moses didn't have the authority alone, that they also should have the authority. The Lord opened up the ground and swallowed them up. 
them and their families. These are spots in your feasts of charity. So this shows that sometimes, many times we talk about all oh, those apostates out there in the world. They are in the midst of the Lord's sheep. This is why Jude's writing with such vigor here to warn. These are the enemy amongst us. And it's subtle because when they come in, it's not apparent, obviously apparent. Satan's subtle. He's not dressed up in a red suit, horns, and a pitchfork. So many portray him. He's standing in pulpits with men who open this Bible and tell you to turn there, and yet you sit and listen to them, and the next thing you know, they're preaching and teaching away from Christ. They're preaching up man, his words, and not Christ. They feast with you, feast, feeding themselves without fear. In other words, there's no urgency in them as far as their own lost estate. They consider that since they're among those who are the Lord's people, and they have some particular position of authority among them, that they're content. Jude here calls them clouds without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead plucked up by the roots. These are things that visibly men don't apparently see because they look at certain preachers and they say, well, certainly that's a man of God. But the warning here is that there's been no work of the Spirit done in their heart. They're twice dead. Not only dead in their sins, but dead in their perception of what righteousness is. They consider themselves righteous based upon some work that they've done and not the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. It's difficult for some to imagine that they will be spending eternity separated from God right along with those that preached for them all those years. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all. That word convince means in the sense of convict, as in a trial. All that are ungodly among them with all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed. He's speaking here about people that were preachers and open this book to preach, but they didn't declare Christ as God's justification. And therefore, everything about them is still ungodly. That themselves included of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. That's the real issue right there. It talks about people say, well, I'm not rebel. I don't hate God. Well, what think you of Christ? Because to give glory in any part, in anything, is to deny the Lord Jesus Christ. You are speaking against Him. To think that in any way, anything that I do contributes in any way to my salvation, either gain it or maintain it, is a speaking against Christ. It's the spirit of Antichrist. People hear that when you say it, they get upset. It's like people we talk with, I hear what you're saying, but I still think what they're talking about is this little supposed free will in me is what seals the deal. God's done all he can do and now the rest is up to, to, to you. No. That's to speak against Christ who alone came worked out righteousness. He earned and established it, and God approved it. And when he laid down his life, it was then and there at the cross that God justified those for whom Christ paid the debt. It's not when you believe that you're justified. That's a popular 
philosophy today, but it's dead because it makes people think that somehow God was waiting for that time. Even those that say he gives the faith. You're still saying, though, that the work of Christ didn't actually put away the sin until you believe. You're still saying that then you're still under the wrath of God until you believe. That's to speak against him. It says these are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts. When it says murmurers and complainers, they can never get enough of the glory. So that's what they complain about. That's their murmur. I deserve more attention from those to whom I preach. And their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. Because of advantage. You realize the longevity of a preacher in one place today is less than two years. They keep hopping around, moving around, trying to figure out a better place, a better position, seeking men's advantage, desiring the admiration of men's persons. It's like some have told me, I can see what you preach in the scriptures, but I could never preach that in my congregation. Why not? It's in the word. Well, they would kick me out. So they continue to deceive, lead astray. But beloved, you see the contrast here between these reprobates that God has ordained to condemnation. And I'll tell you, if God ordains any to condemnation, they'll never believe. But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, Jude, even right here, takes no advantage of being a half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. He realizes, just like Mary, they exalt Mary, but she called Christ her redeemer. How that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. When did the last time begin? Well, that's when Christ came the first time. He came, as scriptures say, at the end of the world. That, that clock's been ticking ever since he Okay. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, notice, having not the spirit. They might have the name, call themselves servants of God or Christ, but they have not the spirit. The spirit doesn't speak of himself. The spirit doesn't bring any glory to man. The spirit does one thing that shines the light on the Lord Jesus Christ, gives him all the glory. That's them. They have separated themselves. That means that they put themselves apart as preachers, and yet God never set them apart. Have not the Spirit. But ye, beloved, see how tender Jude writes this tenderly? Building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. When it says building up yourselves, this is talking about the edification of one another as a body, when it says on your most holy faith, that's Christ. Faith's object is Christ. Where we see faith in the objective here, it is Christ. Praying in the Holy Ghost. That's the only way to pray. The cry of the sinner to look to Christ and that need comes from the Holy Ghost. So keep yourselves in the love of God. People get off track again when they see that word yourselves, keep yourselves in the love of God. What that means is that we look to the Lord God and His love for us. It's not keeping ourselves in our love for God. It's how are we kept but His love for us. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. That's how one is kept in the love of God, knowing that everyone for whom Christ died, God loved him, paid the debt, and it's him that keeps them. And if some have compassion, making a difference. We can't just lump everybody as reprobates because for this time, this moment, they appear not to know the Lord. Remember, as we began here, even our Lord's brethren, his half-brothers here, initially did not believe on him. But in time, it pleased God to draw them. Well, have compassion making a difference. 
knowing that we were at one point of that number ourselves. So have compassion, in other words, as we hear people deny Christ through their words and their ways, well, they still might be the Lord's. It's just that the Lord has not yet revealed himself in them. But making a difference. And others saved with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. That, that's works religion. That's the thing of which we speak against all the time. When we find somebody that has a mixed faith, they say, well, that's Christ plus. No. Notice the word used there, hated. Hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. That's that profession of ones that believe that somehow they're righteous based on some work of the flesh. That flesh can only tarnish anything that you put on. Christ's garment alone, that righteousness imputed, when Christ finished the work at the cross, that is the unspotted garment of which all those that have been taught of him, they wear down to him that is able to keep you from falling. That's important. We would be just like anybody else out there, but it's it's him that is able to keep you from falling. To him there again is the Lord Jesus Christ and his people in his hands. Christ said that of all that the Father's given, all that is known. And to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Christ is the mediator from beginning to end. He presents those, he represents those for whom he made the death before the Father, so to the only wise God. Our Savior, that's an amazing statement right there, I can be God and Savior. It's only in the Lord Jesus Christ. Be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. You can't say too much, you can't give Christ too much of the glory. As you've heard me say, you might be able to accuse me at the end of my life of many things, but you'll never be able to accuse me of having given too much glory. Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, that he would give us that spirit to glorify him. Gracious Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for how it prepares our hearts to contemplate your glory through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. If we know anything of him, it's because you were so purposed, because of your love for sinners such as we are. And uh, please to sanctify us and set us apart. Preserve us, Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that as we continue our time of worship, that indeed He will be honored and glorified in our midst. And I give you the thanks and praise in His precious name. Amen. All right, let's take our hymnals and sing hymn number 176. And then we'll get to the message of the hour. Break thou the bread of life, dear Lord, to me. As thou didst break the loaves beside the sea, beyond the sacred page, I seek thee, Lord. My spirit pants for thee, O living word. Bless thou the truth, dear Lord, to me, to me. As thou didst bless the bread by Galilee. Then shall all bondage cease, all fetters fall, and I shall find my peace, my all in all. Thou art the bread of life, O Lord, to me. Thy holy word, the truth that saved me, give me to eat and live with the above. Teach me to love thy 
truth for thou art love. Oh, send thy spirit, Lord, now unto me, that he may touch my eyes and make me see. Show me the truth concealed within thy word, and in thy book revealed I see the Lord. Precious prayer. Let's take our Bibles for our message of the hour. Look at 1 Kings chapter 18. My text is from verse 1 down to verse 18, and I've entitled this, All Things in God's Time. You think this is an important message for us? We tend to get in a hurry in our thoughts, whether we say so or not. We think that we can dictate to God how we think things ought to, ought to unfold, and yet God's sovereign. Everything's going to take place according to his word and power. And I see that example here with Elijah. How ever since we were first introduced to Elijah back in chapter 17 and verse 1, that once he announced it would not rain for three and a half years according to the word of the Lord, that the Lord took him and put him in hiding. It wasn't until that period of time was passed that we find now the Lord giving this word to Elijah to reveal him publicly. And I've talked before about the parallels between our Lord Jesus Christ and Elijah. I know that the Lord uses him as a type of John the Baptist as well, where for some time, John the Baptist was the voice in the wilderness, and it was again in the Lord's time that he began to bring people to him and make him known publicly. Well, that's what we see here with Elijah, and by parallel, our Lord Jesus Christ. Think about the many years up to age 30 that the Lord is on the earth, and relatively little is revealed of him. He was hidden, but it wasn't until John the Baptist announced, Behold the Lamb of God, that Christ was publicly then made known to the people of Israel. And then the battle began. Here, Elijah was enjoying some relative calm and peace, living with his widow. But now comes the battle. Now comes the reason for which God raised him up. So it says here in verse 1 of chapter 18, it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year. It's been the third year since the Lord had shut up the heavens and it had not rained, saying, Go show thyself unto Ahab. Now here we see Elijah serving a twofold role. He said in the last chapter, Go show thyself unto the widow of Sarepta. It was for her deliverance. Here we read, Go show thyself unto Ahab. This was not for his deliverance, but his condemnation. And notice the unconditional way in which God works. That's why I say, all things in God's time because God had stopped the rain for these three years and some might say well God was waiting for Israel to repent God was waiting for Ahab to repent in order to bring the rain again well if that had been the case it never would have rained again the whole place would have burned up but notice, go show thyself unto Ahab, 
and I will send rain upon the earth. This shows again all things in God's time. They're according to his word and power. All of his creation lives, moves, and has its being in him. And in a world of evil, God's going to get himself the glory in determining how he will act among evil men. And I believe the point here that we're going to see, because you remember this is going to lead into the challenge that Elijah gives to Ahab and the false prophets to meet on Mount Carmel. And all of that was for one reason. It wasn't to try to get them to repent. It's not God saying, well, here we go one more time. It's like hear people say, well, Christ is waiting to come back because there's still some he wants to give that chance or opportunity to repent. I'll tell you, if that were the case, he'd never return. Because every time a new person is born in this world, that's a rebellious sinner. And if God has to somehow wait, he'll never return. That's not what is keeping Christ from coming back and exercising his judgment in this world. You read Peter on the matter, it's because there are still <coughs> those elect that for whom Christ paid the debt that he must yet bring. But once that last one is brought in, there's nothing keeping Christ from coming back and doing his bidding. So here again, God's purpose in sending Elijah to Ahab is not to beg him, won't you please, I'd like to be able to have God send the rain again, but unless you believe, I can't. No. It's declared from the beginning, go show thyself unto Ahab. This is God's way of showing Ahab that God is the God of Israel. Ahab was but a minion, if you will, an instrument in God's hands to serve his purpose. And when he says, I will send rain upon the earth, it's without condition. God is going to send that rain in his time when he's pleased, that all may know that he's God. And so Elijah went to show himself unto Ahab. Now you got, this is a ruthless king. This was one that was already being blamed for being a troubler in Israel. I've actually had some say that about me, the gospel message that I preach. They have accused me of being a troubler in Israel, a divider of the brethren. Because when you don't hold back, when you declare Christ and his glory, just as God reveals him in this word, no holds barred, there's going to be a problem. And I find the courage and the strength, see what God orders, he provides. Elijah, we already saw that over in James. He was a man of like nature, such as we are. So it wasn't like he was a superhero. You think about even Elijah. As the Lord raised him up and what he had to face, it's like Isaiah in his day, where the Lord said, I'm going to send you out, but they'll hear, but they won't hear. They'll see, but they won't see. I don't know if Isaiah ever saw a conversion in his lifetime. All the years that he preached, 40 plus years. And so Elijah, the Lord is sending him forth to show himself unto Ahab, but it's that Ahab might know that God is God. It says here there was a sore famine in Samaria. Remember, this is the part of Israel, those 10 tribes that Jeroboam took with him away, and they established their thrown their seat up there in Samaria. There was a sore famine in Samaria. We're going to see here in a little bit that in actuality down in Judah where God had put his name to bless those two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, who did not go after Jeroboam and following this false worship that actually things were pretty good flourishing down in that area, but not in Samaria. That's how God shows his power, where he can cause it to rain on the just and the unjust. 
he can bless where he wants and he can withhold his blessing where he purposes. And so Ahab called Obadiah. There's like 14 different Obadiahs when you're reading in Scripture. So the natural thought is to think, well, he's talking there about the prophet that wrote the book of Obadiah. But that would have been several hundred years later. But this man here is named Obadiah. And his name can mean either a servant of the Lord or a worshiper of the Lord. When you talk about God's sovereignty, our focus has been on Elijah and how the Lord has kept Elijah. But here is one of the Lords that it says was the governor of his house. And it says, Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. You say, how can that be? He's the governor of the house of one of the worst kings of Israel. And yet that's where the Lord placed him. Think of Joseph in Egypt. Think of Daniel in Babylon. Think of Moses, who was raised in Pharaoh's household. Here was one Obadiah that says that feared the Lord greatly. If he feared the Lord, that meant that he would have heard of the Lord through the teachings of the Scriptures to this point. And the Spirit of God would have done a work of grace in his heart. He evidently, this isn't a position you choose for yourself, that Ahab, even as wicked as he was, saw something in Obadiah that he wanted him to be the governor. I suppose it was because he was trustworthy. You think about our workplaces. If we're the Lord's children in those workplaces, then just by the grace of God, we're going to be the best employees that they could ever have. And not that we would take any glory to ourselves, but it's those very things that they world sees in us that they approve and like and so they want us to fill these different positions and if you ever ask well what about so and so no you can't trust them now, we're of like nature as anybody but the Lord places us in these different positions for his glory and, and purpose and I believe that's why the Lord caused Ahab to choose Obadiah again all things in God's time we don't know all the history that brought him to this place. But when you read on here, you realize why the Lord placed him there. It wasn't to gain Ahab's favor. It wasn't to promote himself in his position. It says in verse 4, For it was so when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord that Obadiah took an hundred prophets. Think about what risk this was to himself because he was a public figure. People were watching. And this would be no easy task were it not that the Lord purposely blinded others while he was doing this, but his heart was set on protecting these hundred prophets. Remember later, Elijah is lamenting that he alone is left alive. The Lord had to remind him that he had 7,000 that had not bowed the knee to Baal. Here were a hundred such prophets. These were ones that had as their mission at this particular time to declare the word of the Lord. But we find Obadiah taking and hiding them by 50 in a cave, keeping them separate, and then fed them with bread and water. I'll tell you, when you're starving and there's nothing else to eat, there's nothing like bread and water water to quench the thirst and bread to satisfy the, the needs of the body. I believe that's why bread and water are symbolic of who the Lord Jesus Christ is. You think about those that are the Lord's living in this world in a desert and being pursued and yet who is our bread? Who is our water? Well, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank him while there's all kinds of possible outside, here we sit reading this word. And just like the last hymn we, we sung there, break thou the bread of life. He's the hidden word within the word. And that's what we desire. That's what we feed on. We don't want to hear anything else like 
Jude said, that this is the faith once delivered unto saints. We find the Lord having placed Obadiah in that position, even to be able to have bread and water. He likely took this from whatever he had had in store and would have had to go out at the risk of his life to make sure that these were fed. But Ahab was all the while blinded. This is where the Lord will blind those to protect his own. Ahab said unto Obadiah, Go into the land unto all fountains of water and unto all brooks. Peradventure we may find grass to save the horses and mules alive, that we lose not all the beasts. Isn't this interesting? And this is a sign of being left to oneself that in everything that was going on, Ahab gave no consideration at all to his soul's need or to the Lord God. What was his primary preoccupation here? It was material things, find grass to save the horses, mules alive, that we lose not all the beasts. I remember being with a dying man one time that had some fields on his deathbed. He was giving instruction to his sons as to what he wanted done with some of the coffee crops that were being brought in and some of the other produce of the field. Act as if he had even another day to live and he was dying. And when I spoke with him and endeavored to point him to the Lord Jesus Christ, that wasn't his interest. Right up to his dying breath, he was concerned about the material things. That's where the Lord used that parable of the, the fool. He kept saying, tomorrow I'm going to build bigger and better barns. And the Lord said, thou fool, tonight shall your soul be required of you. Such was Ahab's case. Again, I'll tell you, when the Lord turns you over to your own flesh, it'll be for your destruction. So they divided the land between them to pass throughout it. Ahab went one way by himself and Obadiah went another way by himself. This shows you to that point that the trust that Ahab had in Obadiah, he's actually sending him out on his own. And as Obadiah was in the way, verse 7, behold, Elijah met him. And he knew him. That is, Obadiah, again, being one of the Lord's, recognized he'd heard of Elijah, but now he was seen in his eyes. And he fell on his face and said, Art thou that, my Lord, Elijah? Such was the respect that he had for him, having heard of him, knowing him to be the Lord's prophet, that he refers to him as Lord, not in capital L O R D, but one who was the Lord's and the Lord's servant. We find him here ready to hear, to listen. And so Elijah answered him, I am, go tell thy Lord. Behold, Elijah is here. He was God's representative. And Obadiah was to go and stand before Ahab and let him know that while Elijah, this one that they'd heard of for so long, he was now here and uh, would meet with Ahab, not for compromise, but to declare unto him the word of the Lord. I think of John the Baptist, who declared the word of the Lord unto Herod without fear, ended up losing his head for it. But that's what the Lord so purposed. And so Elijah, speaking here in the place of his Lord, his God, says, go tell him, behold, Elijah is here. He said, what have I sinned that thou wouldst deliver thy servant in the hand of Ahab to slay me? You can understand the fear. And now Obadiah is being asked to do something that might jeopardize his life because he knew Ahab, seen his ways. And he says to Elijah, As the Lord thy God liveth, there is no nation or kingdom whither my Lord hath not sent to seek thee. 
And when they said, He is not there, He took an oath of the kingdom and nation that they found thee not. He's talking about how Ahab had put out the word that anybody that sees Elijah, that they're to let him know or perish. And this had to do not only with those in the nation of Israel, but it says here he took an oath of the kingdom and nation that they found thee not. In other words, he was going to question everybody around, the surrounding nations, whether they'd seen Elijah. And if they lied, then it meant death. And now thou sayest, verse 11, go tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah is here. We face the same sort of confrontation today, much as in Elijah's day when we're called upon sometimes, it might be even at risk of our, I won't say our lives, I don't know if we've ever had that, but maybe our jobs, maybe a promotion, maybe something, that by declaring who Christ is, and behold, Christ is here. He's the one ruling and reigning. He's the one directing all things. And I know it's getting tougher, like in classrooms and schools. It might be in your, your job. But where the Lord directs, we speak. And it says the Lord directs that, that we speak. So it shall come to pass, verse 12, he's saying, as soon as I'm gone from thee, but here again, it shows that Obadiah, who feared the Lord greatly, yet he struggled as a man with his situation. As soon as I let Ahab know that you're here, he said, I fear that the Spirit of the Lord will carry thee whither I know not. <laughs> you're going to set me up, you're going to tell me to tell Ahab this, and then you're going to be gone. And so when I come and tell Ahab, and he cannot find thee, he shall slay me. But I, thy servant, fear the Lord from my youth. You see how he falls back on that? Whatever the Lord's will is, he, he, he's expressing his true concerns. And yet, he says, I, thy servant, fear the Lord from my youth. That's an important statement there. I know Paul wrote to Timothy that from a child he had known the scriptures. We never know how the Lord's going to use his word. For Obadiah, it was in his youth that he learned the scriptures and the Lord taught him of himself and being the Lord's as he grew up the Lord continued to strengthen him in that faith there are some that the Lord has been pleased to reveal Christ in them from their youth it's not talking here about false profession in some of these child Bible clubs where they get everybody to make a decision. That's not it. The Lord doesn't give us much detail to know that here was one upon whom he had set his favor from eternity and put him in a place where he could hear the scriptures read and the Lord used it by his spirit to turn his heart and keep him all the way through his life. And in essence, that's what Obadiah is saying. Though I fear... Yet, I trust, because I am thy servant, and I fear the Lord for my youth. Was it not told, my Lord, what I did when Jezebel slew the prophets of the Lord, how I hid a hundred men of the Lord's prophets by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water? You see how he's finding himself, even in the face of this, falling back on the comfort of knowing who he is and how the Lord had preserved him and would preserve him. And now thou sayest, Go tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah is here, and he shall slay me. I believe it's the Lord even bringing him. This was a test of Obadiah's faith. It's like Job said, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And the Lord was testing Obadiah's faith not to destroy him, but to strengthen him. And Elijah said in verse 15, as the Lord of hosts liveth before whom I stand, I will surely show myself unto him today. 
but he's letting Obadiah know, you make the announcement and I will be there. Just as clearly as I announce it. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him. Now here again, all things in God's time. Because you would think that Ahab hearing that would go into a rage. But here's the Lord, again, drawing Ahab at this particular time to go meet Elijah. Whereas up to this point, he sought to kill him. I know that, again, Elijah is a type of Christ. There were many times where, although those around him sought to kill him, yet they could not refrain from following him and many times confronted him and would have killed him, but again, all things in God's time. There was a particular time and place that God purposed that his son should die. In fact, when they came to arrest Christ in the garden, that's what he told them. He said, I was with you every day in the temple. But what, what is the meaning of these staffs and spears and swords that you bring to arrest me? He said, now is your time. And I see Elijah here. They weren't going to take Elijah's life before God had finished with him. And so the Lord directed that he should face Ahab directly. We know that ultimately the Lord did take Elijah, but it wasn't in death. He went up into a cloud, he thought. So much of the parallels between Elijah and Christ are phenomenal as you can study even as our Lord ascended in victory. But worked out that salvation amongst the very wicked generation. Now he, our Lord did die. That's why he came. But no man took his life. It was the Lord that laid down his life. He took it up again. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And so when it came to pass, verse 17, when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? There again, there's no repentance. There's no concern about his own state. All he could see in Elijah was a divider in Israel. That's how they saw our Lord. Because as many began to follow our Lord Jesus, the Pharisees became increasingly incensed that and yet they could do nothing. And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou, thy father's house, and that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. Thou hast followed Balaam. Baal, that's the worship of Baal, their, their God. So we're going to leave it there for now, but all things in the Lord's time. Everything unfolded exactly as the Lord had purposed to his honor and glory. And I'm thankful it's that way. We need not fear what men may do unto us. It's the Lord that is going to get the glory. Let's take our hymn books and sing hymn number 144. 144. Heart 10,000, hearts and voices. Sound the note of praise above. Heart 10,000, hearts and voices. Sound the note of praise above. Jesus reigns and heaven rejoices. Jesus reigns, the God of love. See, he sits on yonder throne. Jesus rules the world alone. Alleluia, 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 amen. Jesus, hail, whose glory brightens, all above and gives it worth. Lord of life, thy smile enlightens, cheers and charms thy saints on earth. When we think of love like thine, Lord, we own it, love divine. Alleluia, 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 Amen. King of glory, reign forever, by an everlasting crown. 
Nothing from thy love shall sever those whom thou hast made thine own. Happy objects of thy grace, destined to behold thy face. Alleluia, 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 amen. Savior, hasten thine appearing, bring, oh, bring the glorious day. When the awful summons hearing, heaven and earth shall pass away. Then with golden hearts we'll sing. Glory, glory to our King. Alleluia, 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 amen. All right, we'll look forward to seeing you next time.